Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Whiting. I'm the dean of the Graduate School of Design, which is something I'm still getting used to saying out loud, but it's really nice. Um, I've been here for a semester so far, and I couldn't be happier. I could be more well-rested, but I couldn't be happier. Um, so welcome, and thank you for joining us for the first public event of the semester. It's a really great crowd tonight. It's nice to see the room packed. Um, and this starts off a busy week already with a busy semester of um, exciting visitors. So I just want to highlight a couple visits before I turn over the mic. So. Tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. here in Piper, we welcome C. David Tseng, who's Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at National Chao Tung University in Taiwan. He'll give a lecture on the history of architectural development in Taiwan. And for anyone who's been following architecture in Taiwan, that's been a very active history, particularly recently. And then Thursday night this week, also at 6.30 here in Piper, um, we have landscape architect Gunter Vogt, who will give the annual Frederick Law Olmsted lecture. Following his lecture will be a public reception in the Drucker Design Gallery just outside um, to celebrate Gunter's exhibit, which is entitled First the Forest, which is currently on view. I hope you've all taken some time to look at it. I think it's a fantastic exhibition. Um, so this is this evening, I think a really um, important and exciting event to hold this conversation here in the School of Design as we look at things that are changing right across the river. And so I really appreciate the big panel that's assembled here tonight um, for giving us their time and, and making this a public conversation about a very important topic to all of us as um, members of the Harvard community and members of, of the um, Cambridge, Boston, Alston community. So um, I want to turn over the mic to Alex Krieger, who's our um, chair of the Urban Planning and Design Program and a professor here, and he'll introduce tonight's participants. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, it's great to have you here. <laughs> Uh, so uh, again, it's it's uh, as chair of the department, it's my sort of pleasure to introduce a, a very distinguished group of people who are embarked on a pretty darn difficult but kind of remarkable enterprise. Uh, nothing less than to plan and design a new campus for venerable old Harvard, uh, and on top of that, to create the next sort of innovation cluster for the region, as you will hear about. On top of that, to kind of to, to support and enhance an existing neighborhood uh, of Austin. And even beyond that, long term, to establish the possibility of a great additional neighborhood for Boston over former rail, rail yards and highway interchanges and so forth. So it kind of sounds easy, right? Sounds pretty easy. So let me introduce the team, uh, the whole sort of t a team of panelists and speakers, and then uh, I'll uh, reserve another minute or two uh, to set the stage before turning it over to the team. So uh, there'll be two presentations and the panel discussion will follow. So uh, Marika Ruling, as in Ruling, which she is doing right now, is the managing director of Alston Initiative. Uh, uh, especially sort of overseeing a team uh, of uh, focused on planning, development, and public space making uh, strategies for Austin. Marika's professional background is truly kind of extensive, involving uh, consulting, higher education, real estate, entrepreneurship, public affairs, uh, communication in both the corporate and the nonprofit sectors. Uh, and in addition, I did not know this, she's a winemaker. Perhaps you'll talk about that uh, uh, or offer some of your wine later uh, in the evening, right? Uh, she'll be followed by Thomas P. Glenn, Dr. Uh, Glenn, uh, who's the chief executive office, officer of the recently formed Harvard Alston Land Company that is overseeing the sort of non-institutional development uh, of uh, uh, otherwise known as the Enterprise Research uh, Campus uh, in Austin. Uh, previously to this position, uh, Tom was the ex chief executive officer of the Massachusetts Port Authority. Uh, prior to that, he was the chief operating officer of Partners Healthcare. Uh, and that is a kind of the big gorilla of healthcare systems in Boston. Before that, he was the general manager of the MBTA. 
And before that, he was Assistant uh, Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. And before that, he was a Vice President of Brown University. Is there anything you cannot administer, Tom? <laughs> Probably not, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, so the panel will consist of uh, first uh, Rustam Kawazji, uh, who is a principal of the firm, a firm of Tishman Spire, who has recently been uh, uh, retained to advance the, again the kind of the research enterprise zone. Uh, he, as a mod, he's one of our own. I won't tell you how old, how long ago. Uh, a Master of Urban, uh, Master of Architecture, Urban Design degree. Uh, he's responsible for Tishman Spire's uh, work in Washington, D.C., in Chicago, in Boston. That was a part of his portfolio, and I think uh, uh, recently also became responsible for setting up Tishman's work and construction departments in India as well. Uh, and Rustam, maybe you can raise your hand or something, even though you'll soon be on the the dias here. Uh, then Courtney Sharp, another alum. We've invited some alums uh, just for the heck of it. Uh, Courtney Sharp uh, is a MUP, a Master of Urban Planning recipient some years ago. She's an urban planner who focuses on advancing uh, equitable access to resources uh, in our various communities. Uh, prior to becoming Director of Planning for the Office of Arts and Culture for the City of Boston, which she now serves, uh, she served uh, at the Boston Planning and Development Agency as the senior planner for Back Bay, Roxbury, and Mattapan, uh, two important, uh, three important uh, neighborhoods in Boston. And she also directed a master plan for uh, Roxbury, a strategic plan for Roxbury. Uh, next uh, will be Martin Zogren, another alum, uh, a principal at Sasaki, and Sasaki has also been recently retained to further advance planning for the Alston environments. Uh, uh, Martin, was also, whoop, Martin was also a faculty member for about a decade uh, in the urban design program prior to uh, joining Sasaki. Uh, and then uh, last but hardly least is Stephen Gray. So when the two presentations, when Marika and Tom finish their presentations, uh, Stephen will take over and will moderate a panel involving all of the folks. Uh, Stephen's interest centers on uh, understanding kind of political and cultural aspects of urbanism or urban design, uh, uh, socio-ecological socio uh, uh, aspects of kind of urban design practice, uh, and especially related to resilience, and especially also related to the kind of the conjoining of sort of, a, uh, uh, of urban design strategies and sort of uh, humanitarian aid for, of course, needing districts. In 2015, uh, Stephen founded Grayscale Collaborative uh, which operates at the inter interrelationships or intersections of urban design research and practice. So normally I would just sit down at this point. However, uh, since I have been a kind of a follower of the Alston uh, uh, enterprise or the Alston campaign, more or less since its beginning, I thought I would offer a very short prelude before turning it over to Marika. Uh, so you know where Alston is uh, right there. Uh, so the, uh, uh, let's see, okay. So the first major plan, for a formal plan, there have been lots of plans. Uh, the first formal plan was produced uh, uh, by this sort of very important uh, uh, collection of, of firms, Cooper Robertson, uh, Laurie Olin, uh, uh, the Dean of Landscape Architects in America right now, and of course, Frank Gehry was involved as well. And it was very ambitious. It was very ambitious because the university wished to be ambitious. And if you read that statement, which I think is a very interesting statement by then President Summers, right, uh, which talked about how to kind of combine new activities and activities in a, in a different sort of way than before at a university. Uh, and this sort of flower petal emerged. Uh, uh, showing all the things that might come to Austin, but the, but the most important pedal uh, that emerged quickest is, of course, the science pedal. And soon after this plan, or actually in combination with this planning, a major science complex was uh, was begun. Uh, uh, and I think Marika will talk about that. And I think you're, you, it's about to open. It's going to be one of the most amazing buildings built in Boston over the last a decade or much longer. Uh, and you already see the basis of that sort of amazement. Uh, and you haven't even been inside yet, which is even more amazing. 
Uh, so this was the result of a, of a for the architects uh, in the room, this is the result of a rather s of stupendous competition, which I think has not received sufficient uh, attention over the years. Uh, some very prominent architects competed for this project and produced some rather remarkable uh, uh, solutions for what was then called a, sci a stem cell research uh, building. Uh, the winner ultimately was a Danish, Danish architects out of Stuttgart, Germany, and they've continued to be architects until this very day, and I'm surprised not to see Mr. Vanish here. He must be elsewhere around uh, the world. Uh, so something that tends to have been forgotten is that this building began construction, actually construction, but then was stopped as the recession hit. Uh, and for a, a, a number of years, uh, the academic planning sort of uh, stopped a bit, or at least slowed down a bit uh, uh, as a consequence of this recession and the need to kind of rethink actually what this uh, facility might be once things sort of improved. But there was, but there's a, a interesting kind of a benefit from this stoppage actually. Don't ask Larry Summers about what the benefit was, but there's an interesting uh, aspect of this and perhaps Marika will talk about this as well, which is that uh, then uh, the university spent a great deal of time getting to know the neighborhood upon which they were going to do a bunch of things and spent a tremendous amount of very good time. You can see uh, President Faust uh, with the uh, former mayor uh, and uh, an awful lot of uh, understanding emerged between what the university may wish to do and how it might do so uh, to the benefit of the community. Uh, uh, which, of course, was a little bit, uh, a little bit insecure about uh, being somehow overwhelmed by Harvard's expansion. So those years of non-academic planning were very important years in the history of this project, uh, and we still benefit uh, from this. And I'm sure Marika will agree and maybe say a few more words about this. And also during the stoppage, a kind of a, a group was formed called the kind of Harvard work team. Uh, you can see all the deans were involved, and out of that came a certain number of, sort of principles about how to proceed when the process could begin again, including the identification of something called the Enterprise Research Campus, which I think Tom is now heading and will, I'm sure, uh, talk about uh, in a minute or so. So just three more images uh, just for the heck of it. Uh, so uh, uh, most of what is happening is that smaller circle, right? That's where the Western Avenue corridor is. That's where the Enterprise Research uh, uh, Campus will develop. That's where the uh, C's building, the new engineering school uh, for the university is being built. But there's a bigger circle, a much bigger circle, uh, over these former rail yards and the interchange. And the possibilities there over a 10, 20, 30 year period are incredible in terms of becoming a very major, uh, a new district, neighborhood, <coughs> neighborhoods perhaps, uh, for the Cambridge-Boston area, although it's Boston. And th there are already all kinds of uh, groups that are imagining what this might be, uh, hopefully, of course, with Harvard's uh, support and contribution, including, of course, you can see the T, the promise of a, of a, of a, of a station. So uh, I never give a talk about Boston without showing this image. And maybe, just maybe, as a consequence of, uh, of Harvard's uh, intervention here, what has been promised for a century and what is essential would be the construction of a circumferential uh, transit line that will overcome all the limitations of our MBTA system, which only points downtown. Uh, so we'll see. I don't think I will live long enough, but I would like to, to see this happen. And lastly, again, uh, just to show you how uh, plans uh, evolve and emerge, and sometimes they're crazy, and sometimes they still leave a certain uh, truth behind them. Uh, this is a conjectural plan that uh, has not seen too much of the light of day, certainly uh, recently. Uh, and this was uh, commissioned actually by Harvard, but through the aegis of a, a former dean of, of the GSD, uh, and was produced by the Office of Metropolitan Architecture. Those of you who know would know this is Rem Koolhaas. And uh, uh, it is, I would say, preposterous and brilliant at the same time, right? And so, of course, at the time, uh, you can see quite a long time ago, uh, there was great concern about how Harvard will continue to expand across the river and therefore uh, make the Austin neighborhood further and further away from its access to the Charles River. And so, Rem just said, well, let's move the damn river. Uh, and then the river will be, again, the border between Cambridge and Boston, but also between Harvard and Austin. Well, again, it's crazy, and yet uh, what is fascinating about this idea is that uh, 
if it had been, if Harvard had sought to do this a century ago, it might have even been an intelligent thing to do. Because when you look at the 1903 map of Austin, you can see most of it is low, is, if, uh, is, a, is well, it used to be called swamps. It's lowlands, right? And it's still subject to substantial uh, kind of uh, consequences of climate change. And so a century ago, to channelize the river and relocate might have not even been such a crazy idea, except that there was no need for it. So I'm not advocating for the resurgence of this plan, but nonetheless might be part of an interesting expansion of thinking about uh, how we might become more resilient as well as more ambitious uh, in various ways. So with that, let me turn it over to Marika Ruling. Thank you, Alex, and, and thank you in particular to um, Dean Whiting, to Stephen Gray, to my esteemed panelists, and to friends and colleagues and neighbors that are here today. Thanks for spending your evening with us. So I have the real privilege of thinking about planning, real estate development, and placemaking and activation in Alston. And when you think about the very traditional Harvard campus, you often call to mind gates and Harvard Yard and brick walls that in its original design were really meant to be contemplative, insular places of reflection. And you see today that there have been some significant societal changes that have brought physical planning updates to the way in which a university thinks about its campus. As an example, in 1810, the Harvard Medical School moved from Cambridge to Boston. And the Harvard Business School, which was originally on the Cambridge side of the river, moved to the Boston campus in 1927 as well. Today, we are excited about the opening of the science and engineering complex this fall, which yields even yet a new era of planning and development for Alston. Indeed, the way in which the campus has evolved over time has been dramatic. New technologies, new discoveries, new societal issues have required facilities that support innovation and collaboration in deeply different ways. To think that it was really only a decade ago that the iPhone was released to the market, um, or that Twitter and Facebook became social media platforms for anyone to use. And so when you think of that scale of change, even in the last decade, you increasingly think about the opportunities for collaboration and innovation. This area of Greater Boston and Cambridge has been the place of many firsts, the first public school, the first razor blade. Indeed, the first bridge connecting Boston and Cambridge existed right here uh, on the Austin campus. And yet we have an increased opportunity to think about how our teaching and research ecosystem here in the greater Boston area can really create innovative change and the ways in which our physical planning and placemaking can create those opportunities as well. So I like to pause here and just, I will ask you to take a moment and close your eyes and think about a moment in your life when Harvard has made a difference for you. For some in that room, it might mean that you graduated with an undergraduate degree or you are in the process of pursuing your master's or doctorate. For others, it might mean that you experienced a life-changing piano concerto in Sanders Hall. Um, and for others, it might mean that you created your first piece of public art sculpture here in Alston as well. So now I'd ask you to open your eyes and I'll tell you a little bit about my experience. So I have the benefit of both being the managing director of Alston Initiatives, but also a beneficiary of Harvard's innovation. Four years ago, I gave birth to my son, Jack, three months early. And I'm here today and able to talk to you and think about planning and stand in this room because Harvard doctors had created a solution for the rare hypertensive disorder of pregnancy that I had. And 
Harvard facilities were able to care for my son in an incubator with a special mattress created by the Wies Institute that could detect neonatal apnea. And my son Jack, who you see pictured right there, was actually fed for three and a half years through a gastric jejunal tube, which completely bypassed his stomach and fed food to him 24 hours a day directly to his intestines. All of this is possible. I am here, and Jack is now entering kindergarten because of the innovation that Harvard brings to bear in the region. And for that reason, thinking about physical planning and what it can create for the future, the collaborations, the innovations, and the opportunities to really create a space that is life-changing is instrumental to the work that we do every day. So I'll walk you through a few of the highlights that Alex touched on in terms of our physical planning, and then I'll spend the last few minutes of my presentation talking about what you'll see in Alston today. So in 2011, the work team, which was a 14-member advisory body of which Alex was a co-chair, put together a set of recommendations that were endorsed by the corporation. And they imagined that there would be the restarting of development on the foundation, which is today now yielded in the science and engineering complex that will open in the fall. It also recommended that we enhance the vibrancy of Barry's Corner through housing and other amenities, which has been physically manifested in the Continuum Building, which includes 325 units of market rate rentals, but also a new grocery store, a new coffee shop, a new fitness center. It suggested that academic growth be enabled by preserving land adjacent to the existing campus, which you see now manifested in plans for a new American Repertory Theater. It also suggested that we develop an enterprise research campus in Alston Landing North, which you'll hear more about from Tom Glynn, and really represents an opportunity unlike any other for a university of Harvard stature. And finally, it suggested that we explore the feasibility of a conference center and a hotel, which is now also contemplated as part of the enterprise research campus. This planning was then married with a series of community meetings over the course of two years that resulted in a unanimously approved 10-year institutional master plan in October of 2013. This plan was really about reinforcing the idea of one Harvard. We are one university. We are embracing the river. We are not divided by the river. We thought of the importance of encouraging innovation and incubation, about making Alston a campus anchor, about continuing our tradition of a strong public realm. And you see today many of these principles manifested in the Clarman Hall Convening Center, which opened in the fall of 2018 in the Chow Center Executive Education Facility at the Business School, which opened in 2014, and indeed with the new innovation corridor that has emerged on Western Avenue as well. And more recently, the Boston Planning and Development Agency approved the Enterprise Research Campus, which includes a PDA master plan contemplating just under a million square feet of development mixed use lab office, hotel and conference center, and residential. And also, this plan was accompanied by a long-term framework plan that began to get to Alex's point of really thinking both in the near term and in the long term for future growth opportunities. Again, here a commitment to creating a vibrant urban district, planning for a very active public realm, and really thinking about the ways in which we can continue to make a commitment to sustainability and resiliency. And so, if you're walking along Western Avenue or North Harvard Street today, there has been much change in the last 10 years. We really began with a ground-up design improvement process, which yielded, in partnership with our colleagues at Reed Hildebrand, a new streetscape palette, a new way for engaging with the furnishing zone, a new way of thinking about the lighting that privileges the pedestrian on the sidewalk just as much as it privileges the car on the street. We thought about public realm enhancements, and indeed the first four acres of the Greenway have been built connecting east-west from the Honan Alston Library out towards the river and ultimately through the Enterprise Research Campus as well. 
we've made a significant commitment to community programming that has been backed by a community benefits process that has been robust and interactive. Um, and one of the most exciting parts is a transformative project known as the Harvard Ed Portal, which provides lifelong learning opportunities and mentorship for students and adults in the neighborhood. And in fact, we celebrated by welcoming two mentees from the program as Harvard College undergraduates in recent years. There's also a commitment to workforce and economic development, thinking about the way in which we can engage small businesses, whether that means a resume writing workshop or uh, creating a podcast at the podcast garage on Western Avenue. And so today, when you're walking along Western Avenue, you see a new 500,000 square foot science and engineering complex, a new 65,000 square foot district energy facility that will power the institutional growth of this area. You see a new convening center, the art lab, which now completes an innovative lab network. And you see, as an example, a new childcare center at 114 that also thinks about the future of our faculty, students, and staff, as well as our neighbors in the community. And so this commitment also extends to our art programming. We have partnered with more than 45 local artists to create a Walls on Western mural competition. We did an initial partnership with the GSD as well to create a public art installation at The Grove, right at the nexus of North Harvard Street and Western Avenue. And all this has now yielded a public Alston art walk that boasts more than 20 innovative pieces of public art. And so if you haven't had a chance to be in this area lately, I would encourage you to join us. It's a really exciting time. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Tom Glynn, who will tell you more about the Enterprise Research Campus. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Marika. And uh, I also uh, want to thank the dean for hosting this this evening, and you know I've had the chance to meet with her a couple times and talk about what we're trying to accomplish. So we're very lucky that she's done a lot of work on public realm, and that is one of our number uh, one, two, three objectives for the success of this project. Uh, also, I was fortunate enough to work with Alex at Massport uh, and got to see his creativity and imagination. And Alex sees things that at least I didn't see until he pointed them out to me. And so, uh, you know, he's been an important advisor on the Alston Western Avenue project for many, many years, and including, uh, you know, more recently in the work that we're doing. And then, uh, uh, you know, I too want to uh, thank the panelists. So, you know, this session tonight is really focused on the design issues. Um, I think, you know, uh, in his introductions, Alex pointed out all the connections that the panelists have with the GSD and kind of that's why we wanted to keep the focus a little bit on the issues of design and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, there have been other meetings that we've had, you know, focusing on community issues and, um, you know, real estate issues, but this one is really focused on, on design. Um, so everybody has their historic favorite pictures. So. This, as you can see, is a picture from uh, roughly 1970. I think I actually stole this from Marika, but don't tell her. Um, so you can see the stadium in the background, and you can see uh, what this is, which is a racetrack. Um, so uh, you know, Marika and Alex were giving you the vision of what this could be, and I'm going to give you a presentation on dirt. <laughs> so here's my next dirt. So uh, this was a. a a uh, map that I found in the Ward's map store up on Mass Ave. So you can kind of see um, this is so Braves Field, which is now BU Field. So all those lines are train tracks. So when we talk about how long it's taken us to get here, we really need to appreciate what has been involved in getting any of these parcels kind of ready to be developed. Um, and uh, uh, you know, this has uh, been an evolution over many, many years. And uh, this, you know, people may not realize it, but at one time, I know this from when I, if you left off, I ran the T. That was one thing you left off that I did. Yeah, you, you mentioned that? Oh, sorry. I wasn't paying attention, obviously. So South Station used to be the busiest train station in the country, even busier than some of those New York stations that kind of think they 
are the busiest. So this reflects, you know, the elaborate uh, nature of what uh, was going on in those days. So this is kind of a variation on what Marika showed you, but I've been using it in talking about the real estate issues to kind of point out, as Marika did, all of the investments that have been made by the university on Western Avenue really in the last 10 years. And I've said it makes what I have to do and uh, what Rustam has to do vis-a-vis -vis the Enterprise Research Campus and Tishman Spire a lot easier because people are now seeing the vision and they're seeing the investments that have been made and it has become an ecosystem uh, of innovation already with the iLab, the um, Life Lab, and the, the Seas Building uh, as well. So, uh, you know, what we have before us is just a lot easier than it would have been if we were trying to do the Enterprise Research Campus uh, 10 years ago. So, you know, I think one of the things to emphasize is kind of what are we hoping to accomplish with the Enterprise Research Campus, and Marika showed you kind of the outline of the 14 acres and the 900,000 square feet. So, you know, we want a good real estate project. We want to try to see if we can recover some of the investment that Harvard has made over the years. We want the buildings that Marika showed you on that uh, map. Um, we want the innovation economy. We want the R&D. But we want some more things beyond that. And we kind of said, this is an example of going from good to great. These are mission-oriented things that might not be important in a traditional real estate decision making, but they're very important to the Harvard Alston Land Company's decision making and the selection of Tishman Spire. So uh, place making was very, very important to Larry Bacow, who you know many of you know taught urban planning for over 20 years at MIT and who's really an expert at place making, doing something to help this work with the city on affordable housing. Um, the Greenway, which was an important community priority and an important Harvard priority, we wanted to really make that something special. Diversity and inclusion, um, we wanted to try to kind of expand the pie and get more folks involved in the benefits of this project as it is successful. And Tishman Spire agreed that 5% of the equity in this project will come from minority investors, which is probably the first time in the country that that's been done at that level by such a major institution as Harvard and Tishman Spire. So that really is, uh, is a game changer and kind of is modeled on something that some of us worked on at uh, at Massport. And then finally, we want to capture the energy of the innovation economy. So uh, the dean of the business school is the chairman of the board of the Harvard Olson Land Company. And he famously said that if a supermarket wanted to put their headquarters here, we would say no. Because that's not a part of the innovation economy. That's not part of R&D. That's not synergistic with the new engineering school or synergistic with the business school. So, uh, so those were very, very important decision-making variables that went beyond a traditional real estate framework, but they were part of the mission that uh, the university and Larry believed in and the uh, Harvard Austin Land Company board believed in. Um, and we can, you know, obviously come back to that. So consistent with that, this is a quote that was in the Globe uh, when we announced the selection of Tishman Spire. And uh, I thought it was, you know, pretty interesting. Uh, Rob Spire, who, you know, some of you will meet over time, uh, basically said, you know, usually a real estate project is about the buildings. And in this instance, it's about the space between the buildings. So that really captured, you know, a lot of the creative work that Rustam did with his team. Jeannie Gang, who uh, is a GSD graduate and teaches here in the spring um, is the lead architect on this project. So I think they really captured what we had hoped we would see in this uh, opportunity that presented itself. Um, and so this is the picture that some of you may have seen. It was in the newspaper, but it really captures the idea of what are we trying to accomplish. And what we're trying to accomplish is a place that isn't a nine to five suburban office park that happens to be based on Western Avenue. We really want to capture something that is active seven days a week and active, you know, 14, 16 hours a day. And so this picture really uh, encapsulated that. And I think it was one of the reasons why we were so excited about their selection. So I, I want to stop because I want to make sure we have enough time for the panel. I want to make sure that Martin and Rustam and Stephen and uh, uh, Courtney have time to kind of chime in and kind of give you some of the energy and the creativity that went into the decision making. But that's basically kind of where we stand uh, as of the moment. And uh, we selected Tishman Spire on uh, December 17th. 
Um, we have some very ambitious milestones going forward, but uh, you know they submitted a plan, and now we need to work out all, all the specifics. And we'll you know, be counting on input from the city, from the state, from the community, uh, and from you know the Harvard community to help us really refine the vision into a very specific uh, proposal and a very specific plan that we can all be be proud of. Because <clears throat> we recognize there's a lot of visibility in this project, and there's going to be a lot of uh, people interested in what we do, and we really want to get it right. And I think in picking Tishman Spire, we really picked a great team that shares the vision that we have. So I think with that, you guys are going to rush the stage. Yes. Thank you. And me, yes. So uh, Marika and Tom. Thank you. Um, so thanks for the, the presentations. I know that um, probably most of the people in this room um, were not privy to a lot of the stuff that you just presented, and uh, maybe less um, sort of privy to a lot of the work that's gone into this moment when you're now ready to embark at this scale, at this level, for the Enterprise Research Campus Phase 1. Um, so maybe you could, Marika, give us a little bit of a little more detail, a little bit more um, background on what you've been doing to lead up to this moment. Because for many, it feels as though things went on hold for 10 years, and now we're doing stuff. Um, but that's really not the case. And so maybe you could give us a little flavor of what you've been up to in the meantime. Sure. So I think that's a really important point. Um, yes, it's true that in December of 2009, as an example, we announced that we were pausing um, the Alston Science Complex, as it were at that time. But our commitment has been steadfast in thinking about campus growth, development, campus stewardship, the greening of the campus. And so what you've seen as a result of planning efforts has been the approval of more than one and a half million square feet of institutional growth, 500,000 square feet of renovation projects, the creation of 325 new units of housing at Barry's Corner, but also through elements such as a land swap with the Charles Hugh Apartments, um, and the opportunity to think about the development of the former Brookline machine site, the creation of even additional affordable housing units. And so too has been our commitment to the public realm. So the vision of the Greenway has been part of our planning dialogue for more than a decade. And our <laughs> expertise in thinking about sustainability and resiliency has really driven our commitment. So today, four acres of that Greenway are built. We continue to um, work with colleagues, and, and certainly um, the rest of the Greenway will be a, a part of a planning process that will move forward. But we've also thought about how we can create a place that people want to really live, work, thrive, learn, where they want to come and spend money to take an art class, or they want to participate in a yoga program, or they want to learn lifelong skills like computer uh, lessons or software programming. And all of those are now opportunities that are provided in Alston. And then to sort of cap off a lot of that work a year ago, the university um, established the Harvard Alston Land Company. Um, and maybe between the two of you, you and Tom, you could talk a little bit about what that is. Why is there a land company? Why is that different than the university? How is it different? How is it operating? Um, and what are some of the benefits of creating that sort of separate entity? So you were sure. here when it was, I was decided. I was just <laughs> the beneficiary, so you were the so I godmother. Think one of the most exciting <laughs> things about the creation of the land company is the opportunity to really think collaboratively about what a real estate development program can mean in light of university goals. And that is to say, Harvard owns 240 acres of land in Cambridge and just about 360 acres of land in Alston. And so being able to have an entity that has the flexibility, the focus, 
and the true expertise to bring to bear on city building, which is really what's happening in the Enterprise Research Campus, is absolutely crucial to the success of this area. And so yes, of course, as a <coughs> university, we are wonderfully skilled at building student housing and thinking about academic growth and creating the public spaces that we want to occupy. But the creation of the land company has really enabled a completely different set of skills to be, to be brought to bear on this development project as well. So Tom, is this supposed to be modeled after Kendall Square? Is this, you know, the, Harvard's Kendall Square? Or, people would are there, when you said yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Or, is, or are the ambitions a little bit different than, than what MIT said? So, you know, I think when we compare what we're trying to do with Kendall Square, I think there's a lot of positive <clears throat> in what Kendall Square has done in creating relationships between MIT students and the private sector, um, internships and opportunities for faculty to partner with you know, major innovative companies. But I think we would all recognize that from a public realm point of view, <laughs> it hasn't been very, very successful. And recently there's been you know, efforts made to try to kind of recover uh, some of that. You know, in fairness, part of the reason for that is that the Kendall Square situation is really owned by a number of different parties. And so each party is trying to maximize the value of their <clears throat> parcel. We have the advantage that you know we have all the land that we can make some trade-offs that are really a little bit different than what was possible there. But even now there, we see uh, you know their effort to try to make it more of an interesting uh, neighborhood. So I would say economically, we think there are some positive lessons from a public realm point of view. We, there are lessons, but we think we can, you know, mm -hmm. do something quite different. And we'll see with the Volpe Center project, you know, they will have a chance with a pretty big palette maybe to do something that's, uh, you know, a little bit more public realm oriented. But, you know, we've met with MIT a number of times, and there's obviously they've had a lot of success. And, uh, you know, we want to try to leverage what we can out of that experience. But at the same time, you know, make the place making more of a priority. Well, speaking of the place making in public realm, um, what was interesting was almost immediately after the university created the Harvard Alston Land Company um, and brought Tom on, they also embarked in a master plan uh, study update um, to this sort of framework to really look at what the public realm and the de definition of the public realm would be. Um, in anticipation of the RFP issuing and the eventual hiring of Tishman Spire. So um, maybe, Martin, you could talk a little bit to some of the basic fundamental public realm considerations um, in the design and in the sort of larger framework. Sure, happy to. Thanks, Stephen. Um, it is, is interesting to sort of try to figure out um, the relationship of, of the HALC and the HAI and sort of how public-private development works broadly when it's sort of driven by an institution and the institution goals that they have. And so in anticipation of the sort of the, the HALC group and the sort of the uh, private sector driven uh, pace of that first phase of development, the university looked for a master planning team to put that first piece into the broader context, which is the entire 360 acres of Alston. So as we look at that territory, we realize that that extends north to the athletics, through HBS and the business school, the ERC, and importantly, as Alex pointed out, the I-90 parcels, which is, again, another huge project which will happen. So the charge to Sasaki when we were brought on last April was to really think about the sort of the engine of economic development and that first phase, which we knew was going to be happening of January of this year, but to sort of set the stage for the planning and the long range visioning for how that piece will be a catalytic first phase of a much larger endeavor that's going to take 40, 50, 60 years to finally build out. So we were really charged with understanding what we think about the public realm both in the long term, what are those critical connections to the river, north to the business school, south to the potential <coughs> west station, um, and then also importantly east and west on this thing called the Greenway. And that Greenway really is sort of the center of what will run right through the ERC and it's something that was agreed upon both with the city of Boston, um, with Harvard, with developers in the community as this connection from the Honan Library all the way to the Charles River. And so it was always a notion, or it has been for the last eight or nine years, and an agreed upon consensus point, but the actual shape, form, and figure of that is changing and continues to change, continues to evolve, but it's a really important piece 
of sort of landscape and landscape urbanism right in the center of what will be the ERC. So it really speaks to sort of the, the sea change that we've all witnessed in urban planning and design, of course, in the last 20 to 25 years, where it's really a consideration of natural systems and open spaces at the core of city building. And Alex referenced the, the, um, the Rem Koolhaas plan, where the river was sort of seen as a problem. And I think that's remarkable to think, sure, that's how we thought about rivers 100 years ago, 150 years ago, and swamps were a problem. And now the conversation is entirely about resiliency and green infrastructure and how the river can be an asset between the two campuses from Alston to Cambridge and as a joining point between what had been traditionally the Cambridge campus and then the new sort of Alston campus. So I think there's some real interesting lessons about sort of landscape urbanism, urbanism broadly, and the issues of resiliency, flooding, water, and placemaking in the public realm. It's so interesting to yeah. think about that. And, and, and I think the, the other piece is the communities, the neighborhoods. And that Greenway really is this going to be the sort of spine between the existing Austin community um, all the way to the river. And so, Courtney, I'm you here as sort of the public um, uh, I, but also representing a kind of a public voice with some of the work and the planning initiatives that you're beginning in Austin uh, with the Arts and Culture Plan. Um, how does Harvard ensure that this brand new space that goes through um, what is now mostly kind of unclaimed uh, feeling, um, how does that relate? How do we ensure that that becomes truly public and relate to the existing neighborhood? What are some of the things that really, from your perspective, from the public perspective, really need to be a part of this process um, or have been a part of the process that you think are really worth sort of um, amplifying? Good evening, everyone. Um, so right now, the Boston Planning and Development Agency has two active plans that are going on in Austin Brighton. So there's a mobility study, but there's also the Western Avenue corridor study. And so that picks up basically at the continuum site and going west. And I think it's very important to keep that work in mind and the community engagement that's happening there. There's an idea based on a lot of the community input that there's a desire for something like a, another main street and what can Western Avenue become and looking at how it goes through continuing to exactly this area we're talking about how to make those links. I was encouraged in the presentation, the remarks that came earlier about the open space and making sure that there's still a connection there because that's another strong desire from uh, the planning studies that are going on now to make sure that there are links and more access um, to the different community members. So that's something that I would really want to make sure is accentuated. Um, from my office's perspective, I'm in the <coughs> Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture Culture. We are embarking on a public art planning process now. So something we're trying to understand more of are who are the cultural workers in the neighborhood? What are the creative businesses? How can we lay the foundation for more public art and creative industry that's happening? And this is a very exciting opportunity to partner and make sure that this is still a part of what comes to bear. Uh, it's really exciting. Uh, we're happy that this opportunity is arising, um, but I think it's important to make the link between um, knowing that there is a PDA, that it is city land, that's a part of why um, this part of Western Avenue is not in the conversation because we know that you have your own planning um, that's a part of the process, but I look forward to this conversation and I think there's a lot of opportunity um, to be built out of it because we know that Harvard mm -hmm. wants to make a good impression in the neighborhood and that that has been fraught, especially in recent years. So I think it's a great opportunity to bring more people into the conversation. Um, this is a very diverse neighborhood. It is a neighborhood where the average um, incomes are lower than the median for Boston. So making sure that um, it still has opportunities for people to settle in and find um, a place that is relatable. Some of the earlier slides showed that there are a lot of walls that are associated with Harvard. So how can this space be something that is not um, seen as yet another barrier to community, but how can it be more welcoming? How can that experience invite people in rather than be perceived as something that is um, let's say, typical Harvard and exclusive at worst, and how can it be more mm -hmm. inviting to the community? And I, I would say definitely the, the, a lot of the sentiment that you're expressing um, was certainly baked into the process, the RFP process, and ultimately, I think, um, 
people will agree once you get more familiar with some of the content and some of the design thinking uh, that the right selection was made. Um, but just before we get to that selection, I think um, just to ask Tom, how did this RFP process uh, differ from an RFP process that you've done ever in any other time, you know, in the seaport otherwise, <laughs> you know, when you're balancing permitting, financials, and design, uh, what, is the, what is the balance that typically tips the scale? Was that the same in this process? Was it different? How do you sort of uh, gauge this against your other experiences? Uh, so at the risk of appearing to pander, I would say that uh, uh, I had the benefit at Massport of getting to know Stephen and David Gamble, who's also here, a little bit. And so when we started thinking about how we wanted to do this project, and we understood the importance of public realm, but we didn't really know around the country what's been successful, what hasn't been successful. So they did a great study for us and the board, which uh, we presented. And so it was very helpful to have people in the room during the RFP process and the decision-making process who really understood and, and represented and were experts at the vision of what we were trying to accomplish. Um, so I think that was a little bit different because we had people, you know, kind of sitting right there who had a sense of what we were we were trying to pull off. I also think, you know, I mentioned it before, but, you know, having Larry Bacow as the president of Harvard who, <laughs> you know, taught urban planning and could have given the same quote as Rob Spire, uh, you know, is a, is, a big, is a big deal. And also, we didn't really touch on the structure of the Harvard Olson Land Company, but the dean of the business school is our board chair. Um, and he obviously has a big interest as an abutter, but also as someone who cares a lot about the university and the one Harvard idea. Uh, the other board members are Katie Lapp, who's the executive vice president, who really deserves a lot of the credit for most of the things that Rico and I took credit for. And um, you're supposed to agree with that. I statement. agree Yeah, entirely. thank you, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, two corporation members, uh, Penny Pritzker, who's probably one of the top you know, real estate thinkers in the country, if not the world, and Karen Gordon-Mills, who uh, also has a lot of experience in the private sector and the public sector, having worked in the Obama administration. So I think we just had the right you know, group of people, but we also, really, the right expertise um, really made a difference in kind of keeping us you know, on course and focused on those things that I talked about, which really the mission objectives as opposed to the real estate objectives. We had real estate objectives, but if we had a successful real estate project and we missed the mission, then that would have been a failure. And you know, I think the group sitting around the table really made a, a big difference. Um, Rustam, so same, same question for you. Um, just in terms of your experience from the development side, how was this process any different? Was it much slower than normal? Um, <laughs> I would actually say that uh, you know, for a project of this scale, we were very surprised to see uh, of the speed that it went through and that the actual dates that were uh, expect, you know, that we were expecting to receive results from actually were met, and so we were very surprised. It was a, it was a difficult, hard project. Um, you know, a lot of work to be done in a very short period of time. But uh, I think we're very happy with the process, and we were very happy uh, of the schedule. So I think you know, maybe give us a little bit of insight, um, because I know you know the the RFP as it was issued um, was very clear on what the parameters were. Um, but then there was an invitation for creativity. Um, how did that? How did you receive that on your team? What did that mean to you to to say these are the rules? But you know, let so us the, know what you think as well. So you know, there there are certain rules with the RFP that we um, that we stuck to that we maintained. And um, you know we we use them as the core basis for our response. But as I think that's been mentioned here um, throughout the whole conversation, we looked at the overall precinct and we uh, we looked at how uh, one addresses the connectivity. We looked at uh, what are the characteristics of the land that's available. You know the connection between Alston and the river, the uh, interlinking the interlinking of the different neighborhoods, um, uh, creating an urban fabric not necessarily, you know, uh, kind of campus. Campus is not a word that we really were using. And um, so we, we looked at not just how the defined task was going to fit, but we, we also, we looked at how that would um, be self-sustaining and be very successful in itself, but we also looked at how that works in the future growth and how it links to uh, the future potential of the development of the whole site. Uh, because it it has to work in both ways. 
So maybe um, just in a sentence, if each one of you want to take a turn and say what you think is most sort of compelling or exciting about this project for you, um, whether it's what you've been working on, something you're um, imagining for it, if you're just sort of becoming more familiar. But I'm curious, you know, how this project is resonating with each of you. And then, um, and then my last question is, um, you know, when are we going to see some groundbreaking and, and phase one complete? Um, how long is that going to be? Are we going to wait another 10 years, or is that coming sooner? So maybe the second question first, if, if Tom maybe has a thought on the timing and what we're looking forward to. <clears throat> so you can all put on your calendars, December 15th of 2021 is the groundbreaking. December 15th of 2024 is the ribbon cutting. No one is writing this down. I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, you just heard the guy say, we met all the deadlines. <laughs> so it takes about two years to do the um, development agreement and then the permitting. Because even though, as Marika explained, the city it has given us a PDA for the zone, uh, they still have to approve all the buildings and the configuration and the greenway. So we, re we will be going back through that project a uh, process with um, Rustam and his team. Uh, and that's, that's going to take about 18 months. Uh, you know, we think some good work has been done with the community, but we need to go back and sit down again and go through all the things that we've talked about, many of whom we included in the design because they were important to the community. So that's a two-year process, and then it's about, you know, three years, give or take, to do the construction. But we're hoping the whole thing will be done at once because, again, we're trying to create a community, so it needs to be synergistic. And if we just do the lab office and we don't have the other two components, then, you know, we don't think that really fulfills the, uh, the idea. So that's the rough timetable and kind of the reasons. Great. And Tom, your, your most favorite part of this project or the thing that you think has the most potential to be game changing for the university and for uh, the city? So, you know, I think it's the partnership between Harvard, the Harvard Olson Land Company and Tishman Spire. Um, one of the things that Katie Lapp made very much of a priority from the beginning was the partnership. You know, this is a five year development effort. Um, there's always bumps in the road, there are changes, there are changes in the market, and so people that you can solve problems with and people you can kind of talk the same language. Because if you don't have that, then a lot of the dreams, you know, can be left uh, in the, uh, you know, RFP proposal. So I feel like we have that. So we didn't know that that was a high priority. We went through several exercises to try to test it. But I think the fact that, um, you know, that we're in such a good place in terms of moving forward and moving quickly is uh, something that uh, was important, but we didn't know if we would be successful, but so far we've been more than successful. Marika? So I'm the mom of a four-year-old, so I often think about it with that lens. And so whether you are a Harvard undergrad that is beginning your experience here at Harvard and maybe trying out the iLab and trying your hand at entrepreneurship, this is a place where you can learn, where you can build your idea into a company where you could graduate and grow your company here, where perhaps you will be a tenant in the Enterprise Research Campus at the end of the day. Or if you live in the neighborhood and you've spent time after school being mentored at the Harvard Ed Portal, um, there are opportunities for you to explore your education at Harvard or for you to <coughs> come back and live in the neighborhood, for you to think about how your art might be highlighted in the area, and for this to really be a place for you to learn and live and innovate and thrive, no matter who you are. Hmm. Courtney, maybe that's a good segue for you. So Imagine Boston 2030 came out a few years ago. It's the city's master plan. And Alston uh, was identified as one of the one of the potential future arts and innovation districts. So right now we're working on one in Upham's Corner, and there we own a lot of land. But we don't own so much land here. So there's a real benefit of Harvard owning all this land, having the PDA, to really make this be a complementary area for making that a reality, and that's very exciting. Martin? Sure, thanks. Um, as Marika began to mention, I think um, one of the, the fundamental questions that is probably animates a lot of the thought here at the GSD, as, as well as designers across the world, is what is the actual physical form of innovation? And what are the programmatic and spatial elements that um, help innovation to happen? 
uh, we see universities, not only in the United States, but across the globe, are trying to now um, build such research campuses, innovation districts, these areas where they see their primary asset of intellectual capital um, monetized in a way, but for a greater productivity for innovation. We see it, of course, at, at Kendall with MIT and all the um, uh, developments which have come out of there, and it's a great question, and it's a great question not only here, but again broadly across the United States, as universities really try to maintain their mission uh, towards education, research, and learning, but also are dabbling in the sort of the development of commercial districts. And so the question in my mind as an urban designer really is, what's the form that enables that to happen. And this will be a great test uh, to see if we've gotten the form right, the public spaces right, and the mix of elements. It's not just labs, it's also a commercial office, it's a conference center, and it's residential. So is that the right formula that begins to create um, you know, what we're all looking for, which is this new sort of mm -hmm. space and place of innovation? What's the answer, Rustam? <laughs> so, so first I'd like to uh, um, uh, reinforce what Tom said is that we really uh, really look forward to the relationship and the partnership that we have with uh, HALC and with Harvard in this opportunity. It's a unique and once-in-a-lifetime phenomenal opportunity, so that is very, very important to us. And, um, you know, secondly, this, um, you have a blank slate here with, with, with uh, um, you know, the possibility of creating um, what we all hope will be a very successful uh, uh, nucleus for the future development of all of this land. Um, we've, we, we don't look at this as, uh, you know, as a kind of, we, we've assembled, even just for the preliminary master plan exercise, we assembled a, a large team of collaborative designers. We, we worked with uh, Studio Gang, Henning Larson, <coughs> uh, UTL locally, um, Arab, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. But we, we really see the, the kind of development of the space, Scape is our landscape architect, the development of the space and the placemaking as, as critical in the, and it's really the ses, success of the placemaking. Uh, the buildings are there, but, but their interaction, interaction uh, the permeability of the placemaking, the kind of filter system of the ground plane of this whole um, precinct, I would say, is, is critical to its success. So, um, you know, this is an opportunity um, that is, uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a rare opportunity, and we're just going to succeed. So that's it. Great. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, let's let's open it up to the floor now. Um, who's got mics? We've got a question down in the front, and then a second one here in the front. Thank you. Your presentation is. So exciting. I mean, I'm, I'm a community member. I live right next to the Kennedy School. So we see green. We look right out to the Kennedy Park. We look over to the playing fields. I love to walk at, and through the Harvard Business School because although there are a lot of buildings, there's a lot of green. And I notice this dark green pathway that goes through the new area. Uh, but I also noticed the one building that's been built, which is the engineering and science complex. And from my point of view, it seems like the building takes up that whole square, and there is no green there. I don't know what's going to happen when you're through, but what, my question is, all those other blocks that are going to be built on, are there going to be spaces where there are green? Because going through the business school campus, going through Harvard Yard is so exciting because there are trees and there are grass and there are shrubs. And yet, that engineering school complex doesn't leave any place for green trees or shrubs or grass. And I'm worried that all of the other places that you develop won't have any. Yeah, I think this is a, a very good question. So I think that's a great question. And in fact, one of the things you might not recognize because it's so much under construction right. at the moment uh -huh. is that actually there's a whole part behind the science and engineering complex, <laughs> 75,000 square feet of beautiful open space that will be green. It's designed by Stimson Landscape Architecture. Um, it also embraces a, a mobility hub, so there'll be a place for bike parking. There's more than 500 bike parking spots there. So your point is well taken, that the campus experience of the Harvard Business School, or that walk from the Kennedy School further south, kind of imbues that 
your home, you're in a place with a quad and a yard. Um, we're actively thinking about that for our academic development. And then there are translations of that as you think about kind of more of the urban fabric that will be created in the Enterprise Research Campus as well. But I assure you that your walk through the engineering complex will also be beautiful as soon as the construction fences are down. Oh yes, no, the, the whole idea is that there's a network of green space that thinks about not only the sort of, you know, public realm entrance areas, but also the swath of the greenway. So there will be a significant both public park area, but also considerations for every block as we think about the public realm. That was a commitment that was made to the community and to the city as part of the PDA, so it's you know, I think you can pretty much rely on it. Mm -hmm. Next question here. Great. Now, thank you so much for speaking and being with us uh, today. Um, I'm speaking as a former resident of Alston, a current urban planning student, um, and a local artist. So I'm really interested in, in the whole plan. Um, and I'm wondering about your anti-displacement efforts, um, because with development like this that's so exciting and beautiful and has such lush greenery, you know, property prices are going to go up. Um, I currently take art classes at a wonderful studio on 119 Braintree Street, and there's a whole artist community there. Um, so maybe from like the Sasaki perspective, I know you're doing exciting things with the plaza um, at City Hall. Um, what is the design angle in the anti-displacement efforts? Sure, so maybe I'll, I'll take your first question and say that thinking about displacement is absolutely critical. Thinking about the importance of affordable housing has been a focus of ours for a long period of time. And the way in which we think about that has many different layers. So as an example, through a land swap with the Charles Hugh Apartments, the apartments have been relocated further down Western Avenue, but an additional percentage of home ownership units were also created. But I think maybe more important than that is the um, example of programs. So as a result of the 2013 Institutional Master Plan, as an example, there is actually a partnership, the first of its kind, with the Austin Brighton CDC, where Harvard committed $3 million to enable deed restriction purchases so that owners would continue to occupy houses. That money has been leveraged to purchase 14 properties so far in the area. But additionally, in the greater Boston region, uh, so as we think regionally and not, not simply about Alston, we've also partnered on what uh, the program used to be called um, 2020-2000. Of course, it's 2000, so we had to rename the program. It's now called the Harvard Local Housing Initiative. That has been a commitment of $20 million and has been able to leverage almost $1.3 billion worth of housing in the greater Boston area and has impacted more than 7,000 units to help maintain affordability. So it's something that we think of both at the local level, um, in the Enterprise Research Campus as an example, we made a commitment as part of the permitting process to have upwards of 1,000 units of housing. Um, but we're also thinking about it at the neighborhood and at the regional level as well. And I'll let you some of the sure, topics. I'll just say really quickly, um, the, the question of an inclusive public realm is something that we've tried to um, address and, and help Harvard understand. And a lot of our work, indeed, uh, City Hall Plaza to spaces across the United States from a landscape perspective really deal with the issues of trying to make sure that uh, the spaces and places that we're creating are as welcoming and accessible to members of broad communities, whether they're distinguished by age or ability. And so we were able to really sort of open up the dialogue um, like we did at City Hall Plaza to ask what does inclusivity mean in terms of the process, in terms of the design, and in terms of uh, this future engagement uh, with the community. So it's not a, a finished product, but it's something which lives on with the legacy and changes as the community changes uh, as well. So it's a great challenge, and I think something that almost all landscape architects and public space makers are um, beholden to as a responsibility today to deal with, and that certainly is day one sort of baked into this process. Uh, next question back here. Hello. Hi. So I'm also a community member, and this is really exciting, and like I've heard about this project before, but actually seeing how it is in a more um, 
desolate parcel is really nice. My question though is, can you please define um, the affordability piece? Like, is there like a target percentage of AMI that you're like thinking about? So do you mean for the enterprise research e, campus or? E, I'm thinking about um, in like the 190 realignment plan. Is there going to be affordable housing there? I didn't catch where the housing is aimed to be. Sure. So I'll address it at a broad level and then maybe you want to address it on in the ERC parcel. So, you know, we adhere as an example to the city's requirement for 13% um, IDP. And the Charles U example is a specific one that I think is worth highlighting. So not only is there the 13% affordable, but then there was also additional workforce housing that was aimed at the 80 to 120 AMI. And so it's something that we think about often. Um, and as we partner with real estate partners, such as Tishman or, or others, such as Samuels, which was our partner on the Continuum project, we're actively thinking about how we can both create design-oriented solutions to increase affordability, but also think about the ways in which we can enhance the workforce development opportunities as well. So uh, we did a study of different projects around the city that have tried to address this question, and there have been a number of them that have actually been very, very successful. We said in the RFP process, uh, and we said in the negotiations with the various uh, 18 people who submitted bids, we wanted to do more than the 13%, but we wanted to kind of leave that up to negotiations with the mayor, with BPDA, and also we're very fortunate in this community that we have Representative Honan, who chairs the Housing Committee of the Legislature, and Representative Moran, who's been involved in a lot of these uh, discussions and negotiations. So, uh, you know, we want to do more than the 13. We've talked about doing workforce housing. And as uh, Marika said, you know, we, um, you know, we made a commitment to do 1,000 units over the f two phases. Phase one is 250 units, and phase two would be the balance. Um, you know, and, and as you heard earlier, you know, I was involved at Massport. And, you know, one of the lessons I think that we've all learned from the seaport, we talked about Kendall Square, but the seaport, you know, people who grew up and live in residential South Boston do not feel comfortable going to the seaport. So that's a failure. So we, we know that. So we don't want to do that. So we want to try to create a community, just like Martin was saying, where the public realm is inviting to all and the housing is you know, uh, available to, to all kinds of folks and not kind of have a situation where we have a lot of you know, high-end condos as wonderful as they are <laughs> in, some cir in some circumstances. So I, I, you know, I, I think that we're, we're really focused on that. And uh, again, I think that's the values of all the people that are involved in making the decisions. But it's an issue that comes up. And you know, I'm glad that you brought it up and we had a chance to kind of drill down on it a little bit more. Alex? Oh, uh, Courtney, did you want to follow up oh, yeah, on Yeah, I just wanted to say, from my perspective, we're very <laughs> glad to hear that, that there's a desire to do more than the 13%. I'm sure you all know we're very cost burden and it's hard for renters, homeowners, but it's also good to hear about the workforce housing too, because that's a, a piece of the population that is hard to advocate for sometimes in Boston. So I think it would be really great if you can work in that population as well and have a true diversity of incomes. Great, Alex? Uh, yes, so um, let me ask a planning question. Uh, and I'll sort of reassert control with my little pointer here. <laughs> so, so we've been staring at this map for a while. So let me ask the question by pointing out a graphic problem with this map. Not about anything that you've said or promises that you've made, but a graphic problem. So a lot of discussion about Western Avenue. Western Avenue is the only street that goes from river to river. It crosses the trials twice and therefore connects also Cambridge to Watertown. Uh, on this map, and for perfectly understandable reasons, Western Avenue seems to be cut in half by color. So tell us why, 20 years from now, this won't be called Harvard's Western Avenue, and this will be called Alston's Western Avenue, as opposed to Western Avenue from river to river for all of us. Tell us why you're not going to have that happen. 
which would be bad if that happened. Well, I think um, maybe Rustam might actually have some insight, right? I mean, there's some work that's going along. The, the, this Harvard isn't the only player along Western Avenue, actually, Alex. As you know, there are a number of developments that are coming. Yeah. I'd, I'd actually be happy to jump in, given that you know Alex is my former boss and my professor and, and all of those good things. So we've got a good relationship. Um, and, and no, happy to. Um, well, that's a great question. Um, what's really interesting is that um, our client, um, Harvard Alston Initiatives, has um, asked us to really think about um, Western Avenue from river to river. And so currently, uh, that work has been going on for about a month, and we're going through simultaneous with the BPDA's rezoning process for Western Avenue, which is currently <coughs> happening right now. We're going through a study of exa that asks exactly that question. What is the nature of Western Avenue going into the future? Uh, what are the, the carrying capacity for not only the transportation, but for development, as we see, because there's profound changes about to happen to Western Avenue. And it is the connection back all the way to um, to Central Square, but out to Arsenal, out to Watertown. It's emerging as a major innovation corridor or a major sort of tech corridor in the city. Regardless of the ERC and its million square feet, there's slated to be over two million square feet of development, which will likely happen in the next five years, not on Harvard land. Uh, there are significant land holdings that Harvard has as well on that side of the map, which aren't indicated. So there are areas at Brighton Mills, area at the concourse, areas at Barry's Corner itself. So what's really interesting is that with the Harvard land ownership for and along Western Avenue, we have to sort of think about what that 5, 10, and 15 year horizon is and how do we imagine this corridor to the benefit of Lower Alston, to the benefit of the development which is likely to occur there, and to the benefit of the larger city of Boston as we see um, whether it's perception or not, transportation being a major sort of um, talking point or uh, pinch point for new development, you know, to, to say it sort of mildly. The corridor can only carry so much in terms of, of buses and transit, but I think that's really going to be the key as we understand, even as a project right at Barry's Corner um, called Nexus, looking to put in a 650 garage, car parking garage immediately adjacent to single family homes. So it's a great question is what the nature of that corridor is going to be and how do we celebrate its proximity to the Charles River, create a center at Barry's Corner, and then think about the institutional presence um, as it goes sort of east towards the river. Uh, there's a question up here right now and then there's one right there um, following the gentleman that has the mic now, yes. I uh, thank you for a great presentation and discussion. Um, I guess along the lines of kind of from the design point of view and connectivity, I'm curious about the connection to Cambridge and, you know, we talk about the river as a great resource and, um, you know, how it's really trying to embrace that as the center. What are the plans, if any, to deal with Soldiers Field Memorial Drive? Like, when we look at the map, the river feels like it's in the center, but, you know, when I think of my experience crossing, it's really passing through almost two highways. And so is, is that being acknowledged and kind of what can we do as designers to deal with that? you know, existing and necessary transportation? Yeah, no, I think that's a critical question. And, you know, there are a couple of different answers to that. The first being evidenced by the bridge improvements uh, along the Lars Anderson Bridge. So you might recall that, in fact, in the past, that bridge had two lanes going in both directions. When the state redid the bridge, there was improvements made by adding bike lanes and by actually creating uh, fewer crossings so that as a pedestrian you were privileged moving across the road. And as we think about the fullness of Soldiers Field Road as well, we've also thought and we've applied some of our community benefit public realm dollars to this endeavor as well. Thinking about traffic calming measures on Soldiers Field Road um, that might also include at-grade crossings, which are, are being studied at, as we speak. And so I think both at, at the kind of bridge and transit level, um, but also at the pedestrian scale, we're actively thinking about that. And it will come to the fore even, even more um, evidently 
in the fall when a new population of C's faculty, students, and staff are, are making that daily trek and whether they choose to do that by shuttle or by bicycle or, or by um, foot, that will make a difference and we're actively thinking about that adding new bike lanes, improving the pedestrian and wayfinding experience. Um, so it's something that's really important. And it's a regional asset, not simply a, a campus asset that we have to think about in collaboration with the city and the state as well. Hi. Uh, my name is Philip. Um, thank you for the presentations. These are very, very interesting. I just wanted to come back to what a couple people uh, touched on vis-a-vis uh, -vis Kendall Square, and respectfully, what I didn't hear tonight was anybody saying, gee, that's really an example of how not to do it. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe there was a little bit of that. <laughs> and, and, but just by way of background, a little bit of history, there's a similar stew here in which Kendall Square had a big institution, MIT, where you guys have Harvard, a neighborhood, East Cambridge, where you've got Austin, and then commercial and private interests in the mix. And I was there. There were a lot of meetings about different projects, and we'll bore you with the details. But basically, everybody came away with, we should build smaller buildings. Well, guess what? Most of those recommendations weren't followed. And you guys can opine. I think when you walk around Kendall Square, the impression you get is, gee, these buildings are too big. And someone mentioned um, the Seaport District. Same story, at least in my opinion. And I'm not sure if the neighbor who asked the very first question really got a fair answer, and I don't want to paraphrase inaccurately, but the one thing I've seen is the big, I guess it's a billion with a B dollar uh, building, and it's really, really big. And so I guess I just, as far as scale, imageability, we can all channel Kevin Lynch or whatever else, maybe you guys can speak to what specific building criteria might alleviate the mistake we made before. Yeah, if you're, if you're brave enough. Yeah. I'm, I'm somewhat brave. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the size of the buildings uh, that we're looking at right now, at least for the 900,000 square feet, is uh, are not nearly the size of the buildings of Kendall Square. They're, they're I would call them bite-sized buildings. Um, uh, and as I said before, though, we're really looking at buildings that form the space. We're really trying to force ourselves, not force ourselves, focus on... Um, how do we create the space and the environment that we want first? And the buildings are also important, but the buildings won't be good buildings if they don't work well with the space that we're creating. And so um, we are not, um, we don't, I've seen some of these buildings at Kendall Square, uh, you know, so I know, I think I know which ones you're referring to, and our buildings are not in the same scale that you're referring to. Okay, we have a question here and then one over here, and then this will be the last two questions. Uh, yeah, I think that given that you've got some deadlines that you've established and you're moving expeditiously to meet them, some of this is almost going to be in the past tense as we go along. I'm, it'll take a while on your Alston Landing project with the railroad. Just from a point of reference, uh, I've, my people have been in Alston for over 100 years. My grandfather worked for the railroad, Boston and Albany, over 100 years ago. So I come from a different place than most of the people that you'll come up against. What I'm concerned about is since I think you're going to have some planning time on your head, on your hands, there's a block just to the left of Boston, stage right, uh, Alston, Boston. There's this uh, a strip of land that runs from the turnpike over almost to the river coming out at the skating club um, where the star market is and McDonald's, crossing Holton Street into what used to be uh, the old uh, steel mills um, right against the turnpike. And then you have a bunch of other parcels scattered along the water side of Western Ave that the university owns. And he was, he was getting around to it. Um, first, why aren't they on the map now? Because I think it gives you... A, a better perspective, and, and as a community person, fact of the matter is, when you want to take about, when you want to talk about making the university uh, closer with the community and the community part of the university, 
It's inexorable. It's like Putnam Ave. Putnam Ave used to be a working class neighborhood. The university started Peabody Terrace and all those uh, buildings on that side, down at Mount, uh, the end of Mount Auburn and Putnam Ave. So the, most of the people that live there now are university related. And I would think that inevitably, you'll have that piece of land from the turnpike down to the river that the university has now, and then you have strips along the river and people are starting to pop in high rises already on the, on the south side of the river. You're gonna have two neighborhoods, Bosnia and Herzegovina. <laughs> and, and somehow, as time goes on, with the people in those neighborhoods, I would suspect, being university related or science related, those kind of things, I think it's time the university starts to put the cards on the table about everything they own and give us some idea of the way you're thinking about it. Um, so is that, that, is that your question? Conversation. Is that the question? Yeah. So when, when is the university going to sort of put all the cards on the table and really think <laughs> about both sides of this uh, more publicly, I guess? Well, so I, I think to address the specific map question, it's, I think your point is absolutely well taken. This is actually, yeah, this is not a map that shows university ownership in Alston. This is a map that was taken from the Harvard Gazette um, that shows the area that was being contemplated as part of the Enterprise Research Campus Framework Plan. So it's perhaps a bit out of context. It's not meant to describe the land that the university owns. Right, right. No, I think that I think that's a fair point. I think part of what the onus will be on us is to think about the the map more fully. Um, I would flag for you that we had that map a little bit differently in a presentation, so we're not trying to hide that fact. Um, but I think if you think about the places where the university has made investments over the last 10 years, that area to the west of Barry's Corner has been absolutely critical. It's actually where I spend a lot of my time. So thinking about what Barry's Corner is and will become, thinking about how the continuum has made an impact there, thinking about the new streets that have been created, thinking about the future of the American Repertory Theater and the new art lab that has opened on North Harvard Street, but also really thinking through the relocation of the Charles Drew Apartments along Western Avenue, the creation of the Zone 3 programming at 267 Western Avenue, the thinking of the new Joseph Smith uh, health center as an example, and the creation of a new kind of economic ecosystem towards the end of the road closer to the speedway as a place where companies that are you know, graduating out of the iLab or the Life Lab might be able to find a more permanent home. Um, and so I think Martin's point as well, that there are a number of new development projects that are very much the subject of the city's rezoning process is key, but thinking about them holistically is absolutely critical. And it's certainly, the, that area west of Barry's Corner is a place where um, my team and I spend a significant portion of our time thinking. One last question in back. Okay, uh, my name is Mike Volany. I live in West Cambridge and uh, the community I live in has had some flooding over the years. And I'm curious, with climate change, what are some of the things being thought about in terms of rising sea levels? And I know there's a studio going on right now at the GSD around the river and the locks and the dam and so on. But I'm curious, are we thinking about green roofs on some of the buildings? I mean, we were just, I was just in Bangkok and I saw a lot of interesting work being done on green roofs. And is that something that is going to be introduced into the master plan and the design of buildings in Rest so in, in some ways, those ideas have been introduced. As an example, there's a green roof on top of the continuum at the moment on the second floor that is also an active green space. Um, there are windmills on top of some of the buildings at the business school to create wind energy. So those things are in practice um, evident in some places in Alston, but certainly as we continue to think about other areas, it's something that everyone around this table is thinking about. Yeah, oh, Justin, did you have I, I think you know we're, we're, we're uh, I think it's a very important question, and um, you know the the sustainability of the site is is a key factor in our design thought process. Um, the resiliency of the site, the resiliency of the neighborhood, the resiliency of the land, um, having 
just built a project on a pier. I understand uh, flood mitigation very well. So um, we, we have, it's very much in our forethought and uh, you know, and how we're gonna address it. And it's not just green roofs, it's how you develop your landscape, how you do uh, you know, um, water relief, stormwater relief, all of those things are, are all part of uh, the, the intended design intent, not just as a byproduct. So um, I think we should wrap up. But thank you all for uh, joining us tonight for the beginning of a, a conversation that will continue um, for many years. Um, thank you, Tom, Marika, and esteemed panel. Uh, please join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs>